Our last presenter today, Scott Dobler. Uh, Scott Dobler worked with me this year on his presentation, which was shaped also by his experience abroad, his study abroad in Argentina last year. And so Scott's going to be presenting about Félix de Asada. Félix de Asada, a Spanish naturalist in the 1700s. Uh, so Scott's going to tell us a little bit about Asara's work and the way in which science fit into the Spanish Empire. <laughs> okay, before I get started, two things. One, there might be a few people that are going to slip in. Um, they're coming from band, so if they come in, don't like give them a stink eye or something. <laughs> uh, and number two, I just want to say thanks to my dad and who made the long drive from Indiana today just to hear me talk for a half hour, so I don't yeah. I don't even have to say thanks for that, it just means so much. Okay, so let's get started. In uh, 2010, I studied abroad in Argentina, and while I was there, I took a week-long trip to Paraguay. Now, before I left, I realized hey, I don't actually know anything about Paraguay. I'd better frantically read the Wikipedia article. <laughs> so I read it and I didn't actually remember anything that I read, except for one thing, and that was Paraguay has one of the largest gaps between the wealthy and the poor of any country in the world. Other than that, I was just gonna go to Paraguay, I was gonna be a blank slate, I was just gonna dive into this country and this culture and this history and whatever happens, happens, and whatever I saw, I saw, and whatever, um, I experienced that experience, and that would be the truth, right? Well, when I got back to Buenos Aires, I wrote an email to my grandma, um, and it said this, in Paraguay, it was a fascinating country to me because of the shocking gap between the haves and the have-nots. We visited a Guarani village, and it was an amazing experience. The people there had absolutely nothing. The men make bricks by hand, and the women specialize in the production of the same handcrafted pottery that they've made since before Columbus arrived. It was really amazing how people in the 21st century could simply have the clothes on their back and an ox cart and nothing else. My digital camera was probably more valuable than all their worldly possessions combined. It was an eye-opening experience. So the question is, was I a blank slate? Well, no, I wasn't. I referenced the only fact I knew about Paraguay to help focus, contextualize, and understand what I was seeing in the world around me. And also, isn't it interesting how I focused on material wealth, a very American value, as the only type of possession that actually mattered? All of these show that I wasn't really a blank slate. I came with all sorts of preconceived notions about what was important and what wasn't what was interesting to focus on and what wasn't. We as human beings pass judgments on other people all the time. We pass judgments on ideas, friends, on cultures, on places. It's how we as human beings understand and relate to the world around us. Now this has been happening throughout human history. It's been happening for thousands of years and one of the guys who did that was Felix de Azara. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Felix, um, his life, and the world that he lived in, and more importantly, I want to show how his work, both in structure and in content, is a reflection of his culture. Finally, I hope that when you leave here, you're thinking a little bit about what Azara's writing shows us about the objectivity of ourselves as observers, as travelers, and as scientists. So you're probably sitting there wondering, who the heck is Felix de Well, he was a Spanish naturalist who traveled to the Rio de la Plata region, which is in red up there, um, in 17, 1781 to settle a 300-year-old border dispute between the Spanish and the Portuguese empires. Now, the Portuguese, when he got there, they didn't cooperate with his mission. So he ended up being stuck there for 20 years. He passed that time by traveling, studying, observing nature, and writing. His writing was really the first and the best glimpse of the new world that Europe had yet received. And so today, Azar is remembered as the premier Spanish naturalist of the 18th century. Most people don't really look past what he wrote 
about science or what the description that he gave. But when you do, when you dig a little deeper, you find something very interesting, and that was his work was shaped by the intellectual culture in which he lived. His work indicates that despite his apparent objectivity, science subtly reflected prominent political and socio-cultural constructions of the Enlightenment. <coughs> now at this time, the predominant political and socio-cultural construction was colonialism, at least in Spain. Science provided Azara and the Spanish crown the means to justify colonialism. Now that's kind of complicated, but I'm gonna try and boil it down a little bit for you. Science became a tool of politics, society, and culture. Science became a tool of colonialism. And we see that reflected in his work in two ways. First in culture, or in, in structure, and then also in the content of his work. First, his, his work shows the context of the era in which he lived. Um, it contains references to and elements of the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, the fall of the Spanish Empire, the collision and conflict of different civilizations in the New World. All of these are contained within his writing. At the same time, it also demonstrates a long history of travel writing. Now, travel writing, at least in Western history, has been around for 2,000 plus years. And it's gone through many stages over time. It started out being with uh, pilgrimages, and then it went to fantasies, and then it went to corrections of those fantasies, and chronicles, and narratives, and encyclopedias. Each stage was a reflection, at the time that it was being written, of society's expectations. And those expectations remained ingrained both in the time that it was published and in Azar's writing. So you can kind of see just in structure how society and the outside world is shaping the content of his work. More importantly, the content uh, becomes shaped because science became a tool of culture. Now how did that happen? Well, science helped to achieve the goals for which colonialism strove. So by now you're probably asking yourself, what is colonialism? Now, it's complicated. <laughs> if you boil it down to one slide on PowerPoint, it is characterized by a drive for profit, so the desire to make money, an unequal sharing of power, some sort of parasitic relationship between two groups, and then that is usually justified using some sort of civilizing mission, meaning that the Europeans would come in and they would say, hey, we're going to give you civilization and Christianity, and these people are backwards, so they deserve all the stuff. It's a justification for what they were doing. In the process, the Europeans tore down civilizations. They eradicated indigenous peoples. They destroyed languages and cultures. And they subjected the indigenous to terrible working conditions. Millions of people died because of colonialism. But you're probably thinking, science doesn't do that. Science is sitting in the lab, doing a lab report, making graphs. Or science is doing titrations or growing plants, or something like that. But Azara's writing shows that they are actually interconnected. Azara uses science to help accomplish each of, each of those three characteristics of colonialism. So let's break it down. First, he demonstrates a drive for profit. And he was taking part in an enlightenment movement of going out and finding useful products for his empire. For almost every object that he identifies, he states its usefulness, or its ability to be used for profit, or its ability to be mass produced, or its ability to be domesticated, or its ability to increase the prestige and power of the empire. He's going out and he's looking for valuable things. And that's pretty straightforward. The next two are a little bit more complicated. The unequal sharing of power comes in as he starts relating to the world around him writing. First, he comes in and he has the power to name objects. Now, he's there. He's thinking, hey, I'm discovering these plants, right? I'm discovering this river. But the reality is the indigenous have been there for thousands of years. They had names for all these things. They knew what all the rivers were. They knew all the names for the plants. They knew all the names for the animals and their uses. What gave Azara the right to name things? Simultaneously, he has the power to ascribe 
and unify identities to indigenous groups. Now, this is complicated too. At this time, the indigenous groups were very loosely affiliated. They were, people would come in, they would come out, they would mix and they would mingle, they would go, they would separate and never see each other again, and then the next generation would come back together. It was all this kind of swirling about, almost, of indigenous people. But when Azar comes in, he says, this is a tribe, and these are the characteristics of the tribe. And then this is another tribe, and these are the characteristics of this tribe. But that's not really how it was. What gave him the right to unify and ascribe identities to people whose identities weren't like that? Well, he got the right because he was a scientist. He was smart. He was rational. He was enlightened. He was smarter than indigenous. So therefore, he had the right, which parallels, or it goes really nicely into the next uh, little section here on civilizing mission. Now, the Spaniards believed that they were the top human beings in the great chain of beings. Now, this was a hierarchy that went from like rocks and dirt at the bottom, plants, <laughs> animals, people, angels, and God. So it's a hierarchy that goes all the way up. The Spaniards believed they were the most important. Now, using reason, Azara justifies colonialism by arguing that the indigenous were less than human. He frequently compares them to animals. So here's a quote from him. He said, the Indians are similar to animals by their fine sense of smell, by the white, clean, and regular disposition of their teeth, in that they rarely make use of words, in that they never roar with laughter, in that the two sexes unite without preambles or ceremonies, in that the women give birth easily and without any trying consequence, in that they are completely free. And it goes on like that in this section for two pages. That was six lines. Two pages of that. And it's all really rational and it's all really well thought out and it's really well articulated. But at the same time, it's so wrong because it's so <laughs> clouded by his own definition of what humans are. Humans to him were Europeans. By showing the indigenous to be animals, he categorizes them as being inferior. Then he advocates for the introduction of civilization, Christianity, and education. He justifies colonialism because his science proves that the indigenous were animals and that they needed to be educated and that they needed to be put into institutions. So we see how connected colonialism and science became. So in conclusion, what should we make of Azara? Was he really the great scientist that history remembers him as being? Or was he actually a racist colonialist whose conclusions were shaped by the biases of his society? Well, I think it's kind of both. He was a great scientist. He made great contributions to human knowledge. But he was also a product of his time. His science was, a, was subtly shaped by society's expectations. So although he tried to be objective, he really wasn't. Instead, his work became a representation of political and cultural constructions that are important to his society. Now the implications of that are valuable to think about even today. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, well, Scott, science isn't like that anymore. It's not, we, we have calculators now. <laughs> went to the moon, and um, we don't debate who are people. That's, that's not how it is. But science as a discipline is still concerned with these same, the same things that Azara was. We're still looking for objects of value. We're still looking for new products and innovations that can help our country and our world progress. Science is also shaped by politics and society. An obvious example of that would be uh, embryonic stem cell research. If science was completely objective today, we would charge headlong into, into this new field and we would do all the research because the benefits for humanity would be so great. But instead it remains a super controversial topic. What's this, what scientists choose to focus on still shows us what is important to our society and our culture. So I leave you with these two questions. Are we really any different than Azara was 200 years ago? And how will our scientists be remembered by historians 200 years from now? Thanks. <laughs>